John, hobbling on his crutches around his six-seat Piper Saratoga, was given clearance to take off at 8.38 p.m., despite defying one of aviation's most basic rules, filing a flight plan. Once in the air, he defied another and cut off all communication with air traffic control. That blew my mind. I mean, I don't know a lot. I mean, about anything, as I've said many the time. But, like, there's just some things you know just from being alive. Like, yeah, you have to file a flight plan. But then, more basic even than that, you're going to cut off communication with air traffic control? Like, I think you don't do that. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise, and today we're going to be finishing the rest of the Carolyn Bassett story. This has been an eye-opening journey, but it is by no means the most interesting story in this book. As shocked as I've been about so many things we've read, the book just keeps going from high to high to high as far as shocks go. So the next time we read, it's going to be about Jacqueline Kennedy and... It's going to be a longer series because there's a whole lot in this book about Jacqueline Kennedy. So it's going to be longer than four parts, but it's mind-blowing. So if you enjoyed this story about Carolyn, you're going to want to take a seat for the Jackie story. All right, let's go ahead and finish this one, though. This reading begins with, In August of 1994, a few months after his mother had died and two years before the wedding, John came back around. It was over with the actress for good, he said. That November, John escorted Carolyn to his sister Caroline's 37th birthday at her New York City apartment. It was a test of sorts to see if Carolyn could fit into his world, a world where he was always the most sought-after person in the room. If he took her on, Carolyn would become famous too, and John needed to see if she could handle it, if she could bask in his light. That night, she performed ably. Carolyn entered the uptown lobby dressed in black, holding John's hand, relaxed and regal, Inside the party, she hobnobbed and made small talk and bent down to eye level with John's nieces and nephew, charming them with her beauty and warmth. Carolyn was great with children, and this was one of the things John found most appealing about her. He wanted a big family of his own sooner rather than later. As the weeks and months went by, as Carolyn and John got more serious, so too did the paparazzi. First it was one, two, then dozens— it was like being exposed to an alien species, this swarm of photographers, whose own faces were obscured by gigantic lenses, running backwards and knocking over old ladies and mothers with strollers. The more Carolyn begged to be left alone, the more she hid her face and curled into herself, the more they took her picture. Soon enough, Calvin made his thoughts known. "'You look like the hunchback of Notre Dame,' he said. "'Just give them a good picture and they'll leave you alone.' Unspoken but understood was the subtext." Like it or not, you are now my number one brand ambassador. Comport yourself accordingly. That was pretty much what John said, too. But he had never known anything different. A shock to him would be stepping outside and not finding a horde of press. She wondered if he ever thought about how much he needed the attention. And there was no point in complaining, because everyone around them said the same thing. What did she think would happen when she started dating JFK Jr.? Let alone when she agreed to marry him. John asked her, too. Really, what was the problem? He didn't like confrontation, mainly because he had lived his whole life without it, until Carolyn came along. Here was a nearly 40-year-old man who had never heard no, who had everything so easy that he never really developed a personality or an edge. John was conditioned, enabled, really, to see himself not just as a good guy, but a great guy, the complete package. People often tell me I could be a great man, he said. I'd rather be a good one. It was so inauthentic, the kind of thing for future biographers to lap up, to use as the thesis of their books, not at all the way anyone really talks. But every time John said it, people marveled. What a bunch of theatrics. I don't want to be a great man, I want to be a good one. Great is better than good. You know what I'm saying? Like, great is good. You know, if you're trying to talk about, you know, I want to be this good, moral man who, you know, okay, well then, comport yourself accordingly. You know, I mean, it's like, I think nothing, nothing is more annoying to me. And probably because you came from a political family. So in politics, you just have to say what you want to do, but you never have to do it. So long as the words fall out of your mouth, it's as good as done, right? And I think that that is maybe why, I mean, not just because everybody gave him what he wanted, but because that's how he had seen life done in politics. So long as you know 
what sugar to feed the masses and you give them their little dose of sugar so they can lay comatose, then, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going to actually do it or not. No one's going to follow through with that. The book goes on to say that it wasn't until after the wedding that Carolyn realized that her mother was right and that her skeptical friends weren't jealous but concerned. John Kennedy, as he preferred to be called, wasn't that complex or interesting. He wasn't bright or all that curious. When they married, she thought she'd won the prize. Everyone had. But now she saw how foolish she had been. I won't bore you with how I feel about that, but we all know that she knew beforehand, so enough of this already. How had Anne seen it? Remember, that's Carolyn's mom. How had she known that if anyone was going to be the problem in this marriage, it was only ever going to be Carolyn? Not John. Never John. Over lunch one day, the newest Mrs. Kennedy tried to explain her dilemma to Billy Noonan. It didn't go over well. Carolyn, he said, you're beautiful. You're the envy of every woman in New York, and you're the dream girl for all men. Why not enjoy this? Part of the deal with John is that everyone indulges him. Billy didn't get that she was sick of indulging John, that it was hard when your husband, who has been famous his whole life, couldn't understand your anxieties and didn't have much interest in them anyway. When your husband's sister wouldn't offer advice and barely tolerated you because you hadn't been born into their world. Carolyn wasn't a member of Camelot, not even a courtier. She was nothing. John had said it himself more than once. Those who married into the Kennedy family weren't really Kennedys. Having children didn't change that. John said it so often about his brother-in-law, Ed Schlossberg, that Carolyn got the message. Was it any wonder that Carolyn was struggling? Whenever she flailed, John just watched it happen. He wasn't helping her. But she wasn't helping herself either, and her fury began poisoning the marriage, the reputations, and John's easygoing nature. Carolyn got so angry with one female photographer that she spat in the woman's face. Yeah, see, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. This author does not cover for Carolyn in the same way that she will do for other readers. I mean, I still think she's given Carolyn way too easy a pass. I'd like to read a biography about Carolyn that told the honest truth. But, I mean, you can't cover up when people are out in the street spitting in folks' eyes. If you're going to be honest at all, you have to at least show the warts that we all know about. So, I mean, at least... I can give this author that much that she, you know, she is including the fact that Carolyn's rage was out of control. John, who had always liked the press, had physically gone after another female photographer parked outside their building. A little more than one year into their marriage, rumors circulated about John's wrist injury, a severed nerve that everyone suspected was Carolyn's fault and that she had attacked him. Notice the book does say it was speculated, so we don't know that for real. But when you look at the fights they were having out in public, does it surprise any of us that potentially she could have severed a nerve in his wrist, you know, from pure rage? Doesn't surprise me. It wasn't outside the realm of possibility. Carolyn had real rage, and she could come at you with no warning. As her closest friends often said, Carolyn isn't easy. But neither was John. This marriage wasn't bringing out the best in either of them. So, as Carolyn and her mother walked out of her apartment building one afternoon, the photographers following her today, at least being polite, not the taunts she normally heard, whore, slut, bitch, ugly, anything to get a reaction, Carolyn kept her head down and her mouth shut. I don't know how you put up with this, her mother said. I love him, Carolyn replied. It's not worth it. Warning two. July 16th, 1999. As much as Carolyn's gut was telling her not to fly with John that night, she was pushing through. She and John hadn't even hit their third wedding anniversary, and already their marriage was in shambles. Multiple tabloid stories, many of them well-sourced, were reporting that John was having affairs, that his ex-girlfriend Daryl was back in the picture, that John was disappointed that Carolyn couldn't rise to the level of a Kennedy wife. One of his relatives had told Carolyn that she'd better get her act together. Meanwhile, John was demanding that Carolyn be a stay-at-home wife, but had no sympathy for her boredom and frustration. He had written in his editor's letter for George, the same letter he had used to simultaneously attack and defend his cousins, that he was tempted to cheat on Carolyn. I've learned a lot about temptation recently, he wrote, but that doesn't make me desire any less. There were reports he was getting ready to file for divorce. <laughs> this joker. I mean... How are you going to write in your editor's letter about how, like, you really would love to, you know, cheat on your wife? You know, that it's like, because I mean, okay. Just because you're married, it doesn't mean that suddenly, like, you've, you've never noticed that someone's attractive again. That marriage means that, like, you have never noticed, you know, you're married, not blind. 
you know, so I'm not acting like, how dare he, you know, how dare he talk about how other women are attractive? That's gross, you guys. I mean, like, let's not clutch our pearls. Yes, you know, a temptation may exist, but like, it's just not, it's not a threshold you cross. You just don't, like, you don't have to live in denial. You don't have to act like it's not there. But like, I think for him to be sort of like playful about it and like talk about it in his magazine about, you know, what you're doing is putting bait out there for all these women who are like, oh, so there's still a chance with John Kennedy, you know? Oh, so he's saying that like, he's still walking around with his eyes open to what's out there, you know? And so it's like, it, it's, it's like, he's like feeding the demon, you know? I'm not saying that you can't be honest about the fact that, you know, you still notice attractive women, but like, do you need to talk about it and play with the idea and like the taste of that in your mouth? You know, you will end up having an affair if that's the way you want to look at the world as, you know, temptations or something to play with. Just don't cross the line because you're going to cross the line. Anyway, the word on the street is that not only is he talking about his temptations, but that he's just about ready to file for divorce. And that last one was easy to believe. They had had fights about it, one on a commercial flight to the vineyard, loud enough for fellow passengers to hear. Maybe we should get divorced, John said to her. We effing talk about it enough. Oh no, Carolyn shot back. We waited for your mother to die to get married. We're going to wait for your mother to die to get a divorce. I'll be living in a trailer park. I used to be married to JFK Jr. So that afternoon, Carolyn went to Saks and shopped for a dress for his cousin's wedding. It was a way of telling herself that she really was doing this, but she was so skittish that she divulged her anxieties to a shop girl, a total stranger. John had only gotten the cast off his leg the day before. He had logged only 55 hours of night flight and wasn't instrument rated. He didn't know how to read and rely on his controls, which often contradicted what a pilot could actually see. I don't know if he's ready yet to fly again, Carolyn told the sales girl. I'm really not looking forward to it. That night, John got to Essex County Airport in New Jersey later than planned, around 8.10 p.m. It was a Friday, the traffic heavy with New Yorkers driving to their summer homes. With him was Lauren. Carolyn herself was coming on her own from the city. John was still on crutches and taking Vicodin for bone pain, along with his regular Ritalin and thyroid medication. He carried a half-empty bottle of white wine. Vicodin and white wine. Wow, okay, that's a combo for a pilot. See, I mean, I, I get a lot of comments saying, well, but Carolyn, you know, she really is the one who threw a wrench in this. He probably could have done it if she hadn't been so late. I think not when he's over here with the Vicodin and the white wine. So there's that. His doctor had warned him not to fly. His flight instructor had offered to come along. He had had to assist John with his compromised ankle in a landing three weeks before. John declined. I want to do it alone, he said. Roy Stoppard, another small plane pilot, had run into John earlier that evening. Stoppard himself had just flown into New Jersey from the Cape and was alarmed by the worsening visibility. I ran into thick haze on the way down, Stoppard told John. You might want to wait a while. No chance, John said. I'm already late. The wedding wasn't until Saturday. There really was no rush. Carolyn in her black sleeveless top and cigarette pants arrived 10 minutes later. So interesting. Everyone says that Carolyn was late. Oh, she held them up. They were waiting and waiting and waiting, and then she just took forever in a day. But this book says she was only 10 minutes later. So I'm not sure where these conflicting stories are coming from. Where did this author get her information about that? And where is the information that everyone was there waiting for her? And then, you know, she dragged her sorry butt up into the place at, you know, after dark, you know, I, I don't know. Before John's scheduled takeoff, four other pilots hadn't been able to land at the Essex County Airport that evening without using their instruments. The haze was getting so thick that one pilot decided not to take off that night. Visibility was only about four miles and none of that pilot's friends were willing to get into his plane. John, hobbling on his crutches around his six-seat Piper Saratoga, was given clearance to take off at 8.38 p.m., despite defying one of aviation's most basic rules, filing a flight plan. Once in the air, he defied another and cut off all communication with air traffic control. That blew my mind. I mean, I don't know a lot, I mean, about anything, as I've said many's the time. But, like, there's just some things you know just from being alive. Like, yeah, you have to file a flight plan. But then, more basic even than that, you're going to cut off communication with air traffic control? Like, I think you don't do that. It was the pilot of American Airlines Flight 1484 with 128 passengers and six crew members aboard who averted one disaster that night. A small Piper Saratoga had climbed above its designated airspace. This was John. 
in the air less than 20 minutes now on collision course with a commercial airliner. John was oblivious. Ground control alerted the American Airlines pilots. Without knowing which way the clueless pilot of a small prop plane was going, the American Airlines pilots had to divert from their flight path to avoid a mid-air collision. John kept on climbing. At 5,500 feet, despite warnings of extreme haze, John didn't turn on his autopilot. He didn't hug the lit-up coastline. Instead, he turned right and he went over the Atlantic. And before he knew it, the sky and the sea had turned into one seamless black mass and he couldn't tell up from down. Terrifying. Can you imagine being a passenger in that plane? Knowing that John doesn't have the skills to play like this. You know, even if he'd just come to play and was like going to be silly and crazy... But, you know, you'd seen him pull out of these kind of things so many times. You know, he was a Houdini in the air. To be in that situation, knowing that you're going to die because he doesn't know what he's doing. What, a, what an excruciating death. The fear and anxiety leading up to it. Now would have been the time to start using his instruments, but John couldn't. Now would have been the time to radio ground control. But John, who loved to get himself into near-death situations, did not. Was he that sure he could get himself and Carolyn and Lauren out of it? Or was there a part of him, subconscious or not, that he didn't care if he died, taking his wife and his sister-in-law with him? His magazine was on the verge of collapse. His marriage was failing. His sister, upset that John was trying to stop her from auctioning off their mother's possessions, Jackie's deathbed suggestion, was now barely talking to him. His life was coming apart on all fronts. And John did not have great internal resources to draw upon, the kind of inner strength forged only from being humbled, humiliated, pushed down, and then being forced one and then forcing oneself to get up again. The plane went into a graveyard spiral, falling 900 feet per minute. Carolyn and Lauren would have known they were going to die. The sheer force of gravity and speed would have been terrifying as they spun at 200 miles per hour, nose first, into the ocean. When the shattered plane was recovered five days later, its cabin was upside down. The debris field spanned 120 feet. Only five of the six passenger seats were found. John's body was bent backwards at the waist, his head touching his feet. It was rumored on the cape that the force of the impact caused Carolyn's seatbelt to sever her body. Reports were that Lauren may have been in the missing seat. That's so tragic. That's so tragic. And it didn't have to happen. You know, it's just... You're... John's ego at the end of the day, is what caused this. But you know, it's like, this is a huge, massive tragedy caused by ego, but how many times a day do our egos get us into tiny little tragedies? Pushing past what we know we should do because we just have to have our rights. We just have to have it our way. You know, we, we can't stand back and wait. You, you know, we, we've got to manipulate and maneuver and get what we want, you know? And, and this is just on a massive scale what happens when our ego wins out. But every day that we don't fight that, that pride that says, I'm right, I'm right, I have my rights, I get to have what I want to have. That's how we run over people's feelings. That's how we say things that we shouldn't have said and that we can't take back. That's how we treat people like they don't matter. A thousand cuts a day to people because our ego has to have its play. And I just think that on this scale, we can see what ego does, but like on a much more minute scale, what is ego doing in our lives every day? You know, that it, that is at the end of our lives going to equal this amount of tragedy. If you could collect all the cuts that your ego has made at the end of your life, would there be tragedy like this? If you could compile all of that, most of us don't have the opportunity to take our spouse and in-law up in a prop plane and destroy their lives. But we all have opportunities every day not to exercise our ego, but do it anyway and cut in a thousand different ways. Ted Kennedy rushed in to do damage control. He had the remains hastily autopsied, the medical examiner's report and photos sealed, and then arranged for cremation. The Kennedy had little compassion for Carolyn and Lauren's family. John's sister Caroline and her husband Ed showed not the slightest remorse or kindness to Ann Freeman. She'd lost two of her three children. Lauren's twin sister, Lisa, was now her sole surviving child. Anne was terrified that the Kennedys would use their power to bury what remains of Carolyn and Lauren at the family plot in Brookline, Massachusetts. Anne wanted her girls close to her in Connecticut, and she needn't have worried. The Kennedys told Anne that they did not care. John's remains, however, belonged to them, and he would be buried separately in Brookline. Even Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was horrified. As he wrote in a diary entry dated July 19, 1999, the agenda for the day was to get Caroline and Anne together without intermediaries so that there wouldn't be too many cooks in the kitchen. 
When Anne came down to New York City, however, Caroline didn't show. Instead, she sent her husband, Ed, and Vicki Reggie, that's Ted's second wife, all the Bassett family knows that Ed hated Carolyn and did everything he could to make her life miserable. He bullied, bullied, bullied the shattered, grieving mother. They told her that John would be buried in Brookline and that they could do with Carolyn as they pleased. In death as in life, they never considered Carolyn Bassett a real Kennedy. And as per Kennedy tradition, burying troublesome women alone was nothing new to them. That's the official end of the Carolyn story as far as chapters go, but we have the epilogue. So let's go ahead and read that to sort of cap our story off. All right. In the epilogue, it says that Carolyn Bissett Kennedy was 33 when she died. Her sister, Lauren Bissett, a rising star at Morgan Stanley, was 34. John F. Kennedy Jr. was wholly responsible for this entirely avoidable tragedy, yet it's Carolyn who's been blamed as the cause ever since. It was her vanity, her superficiality, her drug use, her all-around shrewish behavior that led an inexperienced hubristic pilot, a man who, in taking to the air that night, broke just about every rule of flying, to crash his plane into the ocean. Biographer Ed Klein wrote that Carolyn was, quote, downright bitchy, and that even though John and Lauren reached the airport that night a little after 8 p.m., the sun soon going down, Carolyn's lateness was to blame. And why was she late? Klein quoted a hairdresser named Colin Lively who claimed he'd been sitting next to Carolyn as she was getting a pedicure that very afternoon. She made the pedicurist redo her toenails three times, Klein quoted Lively. She wasn't overtly bitchy, there's that word again, but she was self-involved. If this was a key to her personality, then I would say she was obsessive about a lot of things. Another blame-shifting version has Carolyn waiting for her tardy drug dealer. In the 25 years since the crash, she has been depicted in countless articles, biographies, memoirs, documentaries, and TV specials as the drug-addled harridan who made the last days of America's Prince so miserable. And so goes the implication. If John Jr. hadn't been so miserable, he wouldn't have been so distracted, and if he hadn't been so distracted, he wouldn't have crashed the plane. This has become conventional wisdom, accepted as fact, and it's left Carolyn's sister Lauren a footnote. Still more collateral damage. In truth, the resulting investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board found John alone responsible for the crash. The report is online, and to read it is to endure a litany of John's errors, rule-breaking, and refusal to adhere to foundational safety measures, such as filing a flight plan or remaining in contact with air traffic control. It all begs the question, was John, who had a reckless streak bordering on and perhaps crossing over into a death wish, flirting with murder-suicide that night? He was expressly told by far more experienced pilots more than once not to pilot the plane that night. He waved off a willing flight instructor who offered a co-pilot that night. He nearly crashed into a commercial airliner that was on approach to New York's Kennedy International Airport. John F. Kennedy Jr. took the lives of two innocent, beautiful, successful, vibrant young women with bright futures, yet one of them has been vilified while John remains lionized, beloved, free of fault. Nearly two years to the day of the crash in July 2001, Carolyn and Lauren's mother, Ann Freeman, reportedly received millions in a wrongful death settlement against John's estate, and has never spoken publicly about her lost daughters or the accident. As of this writing, her only surviving daughter, Lauren's twin sister, Lisa, lives quietly in the American Midwest. Every July, Lisa reportedly leaves the country to escape anniversary coverage of the crash. It's really, really so, so tragic. But I will say as a final note on this whole story, Carolyn had decided that she didn't want to go on this trip. So she probably was dragging her feet, buying a dress the day of, getting a pedicure right before you know you need to go somewhere. I don't know if she met her drug dealer. Some people say that she did. Probably. I mean, you know, if she had developed a dependency on drugs and, and it stressed her out in these family environments, she probably wanted to make sure she had a stash. So, you know, Probably all those things are true. You know, if she made the manicurist do her toenails three times, I mean, probably stalling for time because she didn't want to get on that on that flight. What she should have done was just tell John she didn't want to go, you know, and that goes for so much of the rest of her life. She just should have said to John, I don't want to date you. I don't want to marry you. I don't want to go on that on that plane ride. But again, it all goes back to ego. It flattered her ego so much that John Kennedy, the most powerful man in the world, America's quote unquote prince, had chosen her when he could have chosen Daryl Hannah. He could have chosen the actress, but he played with them, but he didn't marry them. And he had chosen to marry her. 
So flattered was she, so inflated was her ego over that, that she was willing to sacrifice every other happiness. But as I've said many's the time, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be bought at the price of chains and slavery? She had enslaved herself to this aura of the Kennedy family. It wasn't real. She knew it wasn't. But she knew other people believed it was real. And so since other people believed it, she was going to act as though it was real. This fantasy that other people had that she knew was not an actual reality what was what was dictating her life. It's easy to point a finger at her because we have all this room and our egos aren't involved. And it's easy to be like, why did you put up with that? But how many of us are involved in things that we need to get out of, but we can't because our ego is involved? I'm too flattered. It means too much to me that I, I, I got this specific job that I said I always wanted, but I actually hate. It's taking away from my family. It's taking away from the happiness that I have with others. Um, I'm, I'm short with people and I'm impatient, but I got my dream job. Your dream job was a fantasy. You had in your mind decided it was going to be this thing and it isn't, but you keep sticking with it because your ego, you finally got what you said you wanted. You know, it'll all turn out in the end, right? Meanwhile, your life is crumbling. You're in a relationship. You know, it's terrible, but you really wanted to snag this person, you know, from across the room, they seem like the right person, but now you're in it and you hate it, but you still are living like the fantasy was the thing. Friends, we have to let go of fantasy. It is reality that you're living in, not the dream world that you have in your head, not the one that Instagram tells you is a reality, not the one that social media insists upon as everybody puts up their highlight, highlight reel. You have to live in reality. And when reality, when what you're doing does not match your fantasy, it means your fantasy led you astray. Get a new one. Don't be ruled by your ego that says, oh, but really you, you are, you know, you'll, you'll get there. You'll, the happiness will come. It will. Some things just are hard, like the fantasy of having kids. You know, everybody thinks that, you know, you're going to be Rachel from Friends with your kid at the coffee shop, but life doesn't change. It doesn't. It's hard. You know, and I'm not saying that when things get hard, oh, then the dream wasn't worth it. But what I'm saying is that like when, when it is that net negative and there is no positive, but you keep trying to tell yourself, no, it's good. It's good. I'm happy. Wake up. Cho you get to choose what life you live. No one's going to do that for you. No one's going to come in and save you and be the grown up and be like, no, 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 no. We're going to, we're done with that relationship. You're not going to go to that school. You're not going to have that job. You have to decide I'm miserable. And then you have to make steps to change it. And you have to be strong enough to admit to yourself that your fantasy lied to you, but you don't have to keep lying to you. And you don't have to keep being a slave to these lies and to these fantasies. You can make a new dream and you can change things. All right, that is the end of the Carolyn Bassett story. Next time we come together, we're going to read about Jackie. So I'm very excited about that. All right, I will talk to you guys later and I will see you guys on Sunday. For those of you who are still following with the Mountbatten book, we'll have another installment on Sunday. All right, talk to you soon. Bye.